This Table Talk is made possible by Mental Health Matters, a newsletter from TheMighty.com. I'm Sky, and today I'm joined by... I'm Ashley. And I'm Melissa. And today we're talking about stigmatizing phrases, what they are, why they're harmful, and what you can say instead. Well... Hello, my friends. We're, we're back. We're podcasting again. Today, we're talking about something that everybody, I'd be surprised if there was a person who has never been guilty of this, of saying a phrase that might actually be harmful to someone or harmful and in terms of like perpetuating a stigma about a condition or a group of people or something like that. I think one of the classic examples is when someone says, oh, I'm so OCD and they casually throw that out. But yeah, so today we're talking about all of those phrases. So to get this conversation going, Ashley, when did you first, I guess, like learn about these phrases or first hear them used by somebody? What was your first experience with them? I feel like it's so hard to say that first experience because it feels like it's been so commonplace. Like it's probably something that I heard from family members or friends or or schoolmates growing up that, you know, I didn't know better. And so... I probably wouldn't have even recognized those as, you know, stigmatizing phrases until the past few years when I was actually able to learn a lot more about like, in this case, like mental health. That experience has definitely changed over the years, whereas I definitely would have said a lot of those phrases until I I learned differently and had some of those experiences myself. So like the one that I, I know that I've heard very stereotypically is like the weather is bipolar or like whatever X thing is so bipolar. For me, it's just say what you mean. Like, just say it directly. Just be like, if you want to say that the weather's unpredictable, just say the weather's unpredictable. It does add to that stigma that's unnecessary because with those conditions, they aren't, you know, they aren't necessarily what you're looking to accomplish with it. I don't know. What about you, Melissa? What's been yours? Well, actually, I was curious, just real quick. Why do you think people use those phrases? Like, specifically, the weather is so bipolar. Because I have heard that one. And I didn't really think about it until you mentioned it, about how it doesn't exactly make sense. Good question. Part of me is like, how can we find like the origin of these condition names being used as adjectives in this way? Is very tied to just the stigma around mental health, because I think it's I was thinking a lot about how like you know, you go on TikTok or one of those types of platforms nowadays, and it feels like things like ADHD and anxiety are like really trendy. And and they are like real conditions or real like, you know, neurodivergence that people live in and experience. And so I almost feel like it's the same thing. There's just this general misunderstanding, but you know the basis of it, right? You hear bipolar and you're like, ah, mood swings, and that's all you get. And so you're like, well, what else is, you know, what else unpredictably swings? And so they can use it that way. I'm thinking it just kind of boils down to like the misconceptions over the conditions that are being referenced themselves and kind of putting them in a very stereotypical box. That makes sense. I guess related to that, wondering, so you'd mentioned that it's a misconception, but for something that people do understand and they're using it more as an exaggeration, is that more okay? And The example I have is not a good example because, you know, a lot of times when something, you know, bad happens or something, people be like, oh, I want to end myself. Oh, I'm going to go yeet myself into the abyss. And that is understood to be an exaggeration and not an actual, you know, desire for self-harm. But it is also problematic to normalize that kind of language. Or is it? If we're using humor to be like, ah, you know, like, again, yeet myself. Like, does that make it okay? More okay? Less okay? Oh my gosh, you're asking like questions that I'm just brought back to, you know, like college sociology classes where I'm just like stuck there thinking, like scribbling furiously in my notebook trying to figure it out. No, that's such a that's such a good point because on the on the one hand, I sometimes feel like conditions or people's experiences that are heavily stigmatized, like bipolar, OCD, are used as kind of like a like a an odd shorthand to get somebody's point across and so they they seem like cool or whatever but on the flip side like you're mentioning I I feel like I saw a lot of that kind of language use like especially on Twitter TikTok and whatnot like especially towards like the beginning of the pandemic like it feels like a very probably like Gen Z bit millennial thing and part of me feels like oh it's 
it's because our generations are much more willing to speak up about suicide, speak up about mental illness. And maybe that's like, I don't want to say cutesy way, but that's like a quote unquote, like humorous way to open up that dialogue or to try to express what we're going through without seeming too serious or without trying to be off-putting. That, ooh, that just like kind of reframes stuff because I, I think about the amount of times I've tried to explain my experiences with like illness of all kinds to people and my go-to is humor, whether it's to cope or to like, explain things in a in a maybe approachable way yeah I kind of have a personal example of that I had a prenatal stroke and that had some you know lasting aesthetic effects and physical effects but namely you know like my eye droops when I'm real tired and when I was you know learning to walk and when I was growing up I would drag my right leg and so even now you know if I'm real tired or if I stumble on my words, I will say, ah, stroking out over here. And then I'm like, wait, that's actually maybe a horrible thing to say. And it just kind of comes out because it's based on a truth, but it's not the truth. And I feel complicated about it. Yeah, I guess that's where I'll end that. I feel complicated. Like, maybe I shouldn't say that. I think it is a very complicated thing when you're talking about yourself, because like, I think a lot about when we are publishing stories or making content on the mighty like we don't want to like diminish somebody's personal experience so if they are feeling a certain way we we want to honor that despite you know it might not be something that we ourselves would want to say or or write because you know that is very personal experience so I can see that side of the coin but I also think like there are things like that that could potentially at least a suicide and like kill yourself kind of language examples to me those can be so complicated because, yes, there is that humor in, like, hoping, but it's also, like, if you're around somebody who might be vulnerable in that way, then that's going to be a much different situation than if you're, you know, with a group of buddies who that is just a way you cope with whatever it is. So I think it, it's it's so nuanced that you can't really ascribe something can't be right or wrong, but it feels weird. So I definitely feel that. I know, like, for myself, I have some very dark humor when it comes to, like, coping with my conditions sometimes. But I think, like, when I redirect the humor, it is very, it's not related to the condition itself in a way. My, my best example, and it's the one that I, I made somebody cringe with the other day, was just when I tell people that I had cancer. And then they, you know, somebody says, oh, well, that thing causes cancer or whatever. And I just go, oh, it's okay. I've had it before. I'm immune. And it just makes them stop. And I'm just like, oh, this might be too dark for most people, but it is my coping mechanism. But I could also see that if I'm around like another person who has experience with cancer, that that might be incredibly invalidating and they might that might be just as bad. And so I think it's it's really hard when you're like using humor to diffuse and use it as a coping mechanism. So that's such a such a complex answer to, I think, a very complex situation. Yeah, and you bring up a good point about how everybody, like even if they have the same diagnosis, vastly different experiences. And it it is hard to like speak up, I guess, when you hear somebody use that phrase too and say you are like one of the people who you're like, oh, that doesn't that doesn't sit well with me or this does not make me feel safe in this current environment. I worked at a hospital briefly and my first day there, somebody said, oh, you don't have to be so OCD about that. I swear, I was like, I could just walk out of here. I could just walk out the front door. But really what I did was just like stand there like uh, just nervous system on overload. Like, this is fine. Don't reveal anything. This is fine. This is fine. You can work here. It's only, you're fine. You're fine. You're making money. You can be bought. (laughs) But yeah, and it was about like lining something up on a scanner. And I was like, wow. Like, I, I just... It kind of blew my mind how like flippantly people use the phrases. And I'm like, well, I guess like if you don't, know somebody with OCD or you've only ever seen like the very poor depictions of it in media or you don't care enough like I don't I don't know what to tell people I think because I've been living with diagnosed mental illness for so long and because I've seen so many of my family members like I didn't know other kids their families didn't have you know prescription medications around the household like I thought everybody's families were like all taking prescription meds every day I was like yeah that's what that's what people do lucky's not the right word but I guess fortunate that I grew up with being aware of those sensitivities already yeah I remember even in like third grade when I was first diagnosed with OCD 
kids my age would say stuff like that. Like, oh, you're so OCD. And I was like, where did you even hear that? I didn't know about it until I was diagnosed with it. How do you know? Yeah, I'm guessing like they didn't know what the condition was. They, Their parents said it whenever somebody was like being tidy, I guess, or washing their hands or something. Meanwhile, like those kids and people in general, like they don't see, you know, obsessive internal spirals, like being unable to do daily tasks in a timely manner or at all, like because of elaborate rituals or debilitating fear, like not being able to trust your own mind and panic attacks. Now that that makes me think like, okay, well, do we have to make these things more visible to counteract that stigma because language is powerful? And then do we do that? Like Melissa brought up with that example of like, the yeeting yourself language and stuff like that. Like, what is, I don't think there's one solution, but I'm like, oh, how do we get out of this? <laughs> I think part of the problem or part of the reason that we use these terms this way is because the first time we hear the terms, it's in these ways. So you'd mentioned the kids in third grade being like, oh, that's OCD. And I'm certain the majority of them did not hear it in a context of mental illness and had only heard it as a phrase, like you said, to refer to being really tidy. And so, you know, it just becomes another idiom almost, you know, like it's raining cats and dogs. It's, it's not doing that. It's, you know, I'm so OCD. Well, you're really in this instance, not. It's, I guess, one of those things that, like you said, there's not an answer. It's just one of those things we deal with is a product of language of being social creatures that we have words and we have ways of dealing with words that are going to be more appropriate in some situations than others with some groups versus others. I think it's also one of those things, like you said, sky language is powerful and you're talking about the social factors. Language also evolves. And so to me, like a lot of these phrases come from a time in which like we didn't know better with these conditions where they weren't talked about. It almost seemed like they didn't exist in some sense. Like you, you never knew someone, you know, necessarily with one of these disorders. But nowadays it's like, oh, these illnesses are actually a lot more common than we ever thought they were. So I think it's just kind of a product of that as well. But I also think like once you know better, then you can do better. And that is how we, you know, phase these things out in terms of like that general social misconception. Because I think, like we already said, like that personal experience, if you are OCD, if you are bipolar and you want to claim some of these things, you have that right to, even when it makes other people uncomfortable. But that can feel like such a, a slippery slope because what if you saying that so casually to someone else makes them say it and now it's just perpetuating something stigmatizing. I think it's so tricky. I just don't think people are coming at it with a with a hateful intention. They genuinely might just might not know, but by not knowing it it continues that perpetuation. Right. And like the the last thing I want is to put on like disabled folks shoulders the well, you got to educate your able-bodied and neurotypical friends. No, no, no. You should not have to carry that if you don't want to. But I guess I guess we've talked about, you know, like the theories behind this and how we feel about it, some examples. But do either of you have any tips, I guess, for both for people who want slash need to change their language and they're working on it? Or do you have advice for anybody who may encounter people using harmful language? Like I know at the time I was not equipped with the wherewithal to correct that coworker. <laughs> but so any advice? I think I'll just go off of some of my, my previous things, which is just, yeah, don't assume someone's coming with with hate into it it can just be a moment for education and it can be just so casual it's like oh hey that's actually you know a little bit offensive could you just say what you mean instead like if you're like going i'm feeling adhd today it's just say you're feeling distractible like if that's what you're really going for just be honest to yourself and be honest to other people who are actually dealing with things that could be really hard for them and so don't diminish that experience if you know better I think it's also important to pick your battle because some people are going to be coming into a conversation in a better headspace to receive information. And that's not necessarily because, oh, some people are just stubborn. It's not saying that. It's sometimes you just woke up on the wrong side of the bed or, you know, something's happened and someone coming in and correcting you isn't going to help you learn is going to increase whatever negative feelings you're having that day, whatever insecurities. Picking your battles with who you do talk to, how you talk to them, and when you talk to them about something like this. 
But also, too, part of that is, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter where the other person's at if you've really reached your limit and you need to say something for your own well-being. Like, sometimes it's okay to be angry and to say, like, look, don't don't say that, you know, like, that hurt my feelings, even if it doesn't change anything, because it can change something for you just to know that you have said it. I think that's a really amazing note to end on. Thank you both for, you know, having this conversation with me. And friends out there listening, if you want more conversations like this, please subscribe to Mental Health Matters by going to bit.ly slash mhinbox. That is B-I-T dot L-Y slash M-H-I-N-B-O-X. We'll see you in your inbox. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Bye.